Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with uh, update number 16. Uh, topics today are the economy versus fatalities and some thoughts about how we might safely reopen. Um, I am, this is me basically, I am very, very concerned obviously as a public health physician about uh, deaths from COVID-19 and how we can avoid them, but equally as worried about some of the, the downside health, health consequences of the economic uh, devastation that's causing that those health consequences are also very bad. Uh, I'm worried a little bit about uh, how the government's making decisions right now and not about the authoritarian side of it actually, but more the, the fact that the decisions that are being made are made without transparency and uh, uh, bipartisanship. That's probably my biggest concern right now. Uh, and so right now we have to weigh these two things and they're both very serious, they're both very big and they're both very unknown unfortunately. So uh, we're starting to get some better information about these two, but this is a really tough balancing act and it's not one we'd have to make in the United States very much very in the past. So the health impact of the economic shutdowns, everything from lost income, some businesses are going to go bankrupt that might not recover, the unemployment. Uh, as a school board member, I'm really worried about the educational losses from kids not being at school. Uh, for our elderly, the social isolation can be very dangerous, just like coronavirus can. So these are all things that I'm worried about. Uh, calculating this, though, is beyond my skill set. This is going to take social scientists and, and economists to figure out that side of the equation. But we are now getting a much better idea on what the potential health impact of coronavirus is, as uh, unfortunately, New York's experiences is giving us much better data to look at to see how bad could it be should we not do anything. And it's as bad as feared potentially. So we're literally, we're talking if, if, we, if coronavirus were to run unabated with us not doing anything, it's at least 10 to 20,000 Nebraska fatalities, according to the best estimates, uh, could be higher because if we overwhelm our healthcare system, we'll have more deaths, not just from coronavirus, but from a lack of medical care if you have a heart attack or stroke or preterm labor. So you could have, have coronavirus plus fatalities potentially. On a Lincoln level, it's 1,500 to 3,000. Uh, now that assumes we don't do anything, and I'm sure we will do something, and we have been on something and quite a bit, but this is going to be a really hard decision to make. It's getting harder to make this decision because of the level of misinformation out there. Uh, I think the poster children for misinformation are the Bakersfield duo of urgent care doctors. This video went viral. Um, I think the re reason it went viral, they were correct about some things, meaning they also were er worried about the economic devastation. They're, they're right that we may have more child abuse cases because people are being at home too much and the school, they're not at school anymore totally agree with that side of their equation. However, their numbers about coronavirus were so far off, it was ridiculous. Uh, so far off that the, their own professional society disavowed them within days. Uh, it's very, very unusual for a professional society to do something like this, to jointly emphatically condemn their members, if you read down there. Uh, that would be like the Chamber of Commerce disavowing the, a major business and publicly saying these people are idiots. You would not see a Chamber of Commerce doing that be very unusual behavior unless there's something just really egregious. So their professional came, society came out and disavowed them within days. If you want to have the full reason for why their, their math is wrong, um, there's this, uh, uh, I'll put this link on the YouTube, you can wa read this epidemiologist basically walking through how, off, how wrong they got the math at pretty much every step along the way. Uh, they're victims of what's sometimes called the Dunning-Kruger effect or uh, what we sometimes in healthcare when I was teaching residents was what we would call uh, uh, just enough knowledge to be dangerous or even more, you know, bluntly more balls than brains. Uh, and so this was a huge mistake on their part. So uh, if you really want to have someone tear apart the math, read this uh, blog post. Um, the other thing that's frustrating is people looking at inaccurate models and persistently looking at those inaccurate models. So the White House model, which was originally, I think, 50, then 60, then 72,000 deaths. This was yesterday. This model has been proven wrong about every other week, basically. So why are we still looking at that model? And people are also taking the model out of context, because if you see at the very top, it says social distancing assumed until infections minimized. Well, we already have people relaxing, so this model is going to be wrong, frankly, because many governors across the state aren't even following that. So this model is, is not helpful right now. Um, also, some of these models are based on old data. So like in Nebraska, we were doing really well. So if we use this data to project forward, it would project forward to here, but reality is already wrong on that. So we've already had, we had a good start in Nebraska, but then our meat packing plants uh, pretty much messed that good start up. And so right now we're in what we're very worried about, most epidemiologists, is that if you do, are doing the right thing, it might look like you're overreacting and then people start second guessing and prematurely opening things up. And I think that's where we are across the country. People are getting impatient. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the misinformation. And so I'm worried we may make some bad decisions in the near future. Um, if you look at Nebraska, you know, we're supposed to, well, I like this count. 
quote even from Anthony Fauci, who hopefully everybody trusts. I think this guy needs another Congressional Medal of Freedom for what he's been doing lately. Uh, if it looks like you're overreacting, you're probably doing the right thing, and that is true. Our Nebraska cases are on still on the upswing, uh, and you're seeing uh, here, this is just from this morning's website, numerous hotspots popping up across Nebraska. Uh, one of the things that's also throwing people off, uh, even the models that are existing, is that the unusual thing about this virus is how long it takes to cause fatalities. You know, if it's Ebola, people are dead within days. Same with, uh, you know, the influenza epidemic in 1918. People died within days. This is weeks, and it's making all the projections really funky. And so you might get an infection on day one, have symptoms on day seven, at which time you would have been infectious potentially four or five days. You may not actually end up in the hospital till day 10, then on the ventilator at 14, then you may have two weeks or more of being on the ventilator, which takes up a lot of resources, and you may not die until four or five weeks into it potentially. That time lag makes it really hard to predict. And so one thing that people need to not use as a predictor of when to open up is, is hospital ventilators, because uh, by the time your hospital ventilators are fully used, you've got three to four more weeks of it getting worse and you're going to be way over. So do not use that as that's such a trailing indicator. You really need to be looking at active infections or new infections as your uh, uh, metric for opening up. Uh, the other thing, this is also a really good uh, article as uh, this ZDog MD, is, it's, it's a, that's a pseudonym for him. He's a great doctor and he's a really good communicator. Uh, there's a case fatality versus infection fatality. He kind of walks through that. And so you may want to listen to his video. Uh, so basically what we have now is we have our range because we have a couple good examples to use. If you lose, use the country that has had the most extensive wide testing is Germany. Uh, the German CFR case fatality rate is not the true infection fatality rate. That will always be higher because it, it's not going to include the people who who didn't get tested. And there, even with the German, the extensiveness of the German testing, probably half or more of the people who had coronavirus didn't get identified. So that case, the infection fatality rate should be much less than two to 4%, we hope. It, it could be up in that range, but it's probably not. We also now have an absolute floor because we, if we look at New York and we assume that 100% of New Yorkers which are infected, which is not the case, but even if 100% were infected, we know that our, our infection fatality rate is at least 0.22%. And if that's the case, uh, those that, that amount of fatalities would be at least 10 times worse than a typical flu epidemic. Uh, most experts think that the infection fatality rate is probably in the 0.5 to 1.0 range. Uh, we now have some new data coming out of uh, New York where they actually did do antibody testing on a sample of the population, guessing that in New York City at least a quarter of the, of the population was infected. Uh, if we use that and back into it, we know that that would get an infection fatality rate around 0.87, which is in that 0.5 to 1.0 range. But that's how I'm saying that we think that if this were running unabated through all of Nebraska, we'd probably be in the 10 to 20,000 fatality range, assuming we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. So it's time to take this seriously. We all wish this was not a bad deal and this was a bad dream, but resist the temptation to listen uh, to, to ignore the vi and start ignoring those viral videos. Um, you know, like we say, I said before, Nebraska unfortunately started out well, but we're on the upswing now. We're kind of sort of the middle of the pack as far as how we're doing across the country. Um, if you look across the whole country, you'll see, of course, the New York hotspot everybody knows about. We had New Orleans, unfortunately, probably because they didn't cancel Mardi Gras, kind of echoing the Philadelphia parade of a century ago. Atlanta's our biggest international airport. Uh, we got probably this hotspot because of the spring break that wasn't canceled. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Indian Reservation here, and then all these little hot dots here. Well, those are meat pat processing facilities, basically. So here in Nebraska, we had our first one was JBS in Grand Island, then Tyson in uh, Lexington, Smithfield down in Crete, uh, similar episodes up here in Sioux City and in, in the Madison County area. So all of our hot spots are meat packing, processing facility related because uh, the right precautions were not taken, unfortunately. Uh, better late than never, though. UNMC experts are working with them, and, uh, and I think I believe James Lawler and his crew has actually been going to them to, to give them some advice on how to try to slow down the epidemic. Uh, so at least this is now starting to have uh, some effect, I hope. And, and you know, I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I grew up in a, in a feedlot family. We had rounder cattle is how I paid for my college, and I was a 4-H kid. Uh, when I go home, I love to have a steak, and I, I'm excited that Honest Abe's is opening up next week. But, you know, honestly, we could have waited a couple weeks for our hamburgers and steaks, and we could have slowed things down, but we didn't.
Um, so urban myths and legend, I hope we can get everybody past this, this idea that it's no worse than influenza is completely incorrect. And number two is the essential businesses don't have to change. They may be essential, but they still have to change and they still have to adopt the right practices. The other one is this, this idea that it's only old people who will die. And actually, no, there are actually a lot of other people who are not old who will also die because of comorbidities like heart disease, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, congenital heart problems. Uh, so this is, a, this is not just a, a disease of old people, although certainly it's higher risk. Uh, and, and luckily for, mo for a healthy child, your risk is pretty close to zero. So we're going to have to start weighing these things. Uh, this is going to be some hard decision making. It's going to be hard with our current politics, with the partisanship and misinformation. But hopefully this will prompt our, 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 uh, our, our political leaders to rise above the partisanship and start taking these, uh, these uh, actual numbers more seriously. Uh, so what are we going to do to reopen safely? I think the principle is still the same. Uh, we just don't have a good treatment. So it's all the what are called non pharmaceutical interventions. It's doing the right thing to slow spread. So you have six feet of physical distancing when you're out and about, washing your hands, wear a mask in an enclosed space, and avoid large gatherings. Uh, you know, grand, I, I think opening church services right now is the wrong uh, thing. The Grand Line of Doctors came out publicly and said that. Uh, I talked to my bishop uh, at the ELCA. Uh, uh, via email communications and the guidance, I think it's a bad idea. Unless your church service is 10 or less, or you can meet all those guidelines, I actually think it's, it's better to wait a few weeks, especially now that we're in the upswing. Um, you know, we already know what the, that this is likely to be multiple waves. We have to, we one first have to get past this upswing, which we have not done yet. And hopefully if we do it right, our, our subsequent waves won't be as bad, but we need to start getting some things in place. Um, we already know New York is looking like a Philadelphia. We don't want to look like a St. Louis where we initially do a pretty good job, then open up prematurely and then have this. We want to be a Minneapolis or an Indianapolis. So when do we open safely again? Uh, when the state is able to test everybody. We're getting closer to that. The, the biggest problem I would see right now is the miscommunication that the testing is done is not always uh, being communicated correctly to the local health care providers. Uh, I, have an, uh, I have a physician I know in a community nearby who uh, someone, they came in and did a bunch of tests on a bunch of his patients but never sent him the results. Uh, and so we need some better communication of those testing results. Uh, we need to see a sustained reduction in cases for at least 14 days. Uh, that's not happened yet. Uh, hospitals in the state are, have, I think, restocked, but we still have clinics that still don't have enough protective equipment. And the state needs to be able to conduct active monitoring. They're starting to work on that, um, but there's still more that needs to be done there. Um, you know, if you're looking for two, two weeks of decline, I'm not seeing it. This is the Lancaster County uh, site from this morning. Uh, this is gradual increase, not two, day, not two weeks of downswing. So. Um, the other thing that put things in place, we need a monitoring system in place, and that's going to require cooperation between public health, primary care clinics, and the schools. I'm optimistic that we'll hopefully start having these meetings here in the next week or two so we can start planning this out. Uh, should you wear a mask? Yes, you should. I think we need to start acting more like the Japanese. I have a daughter who lives in, in Kyoto. This is the norm for Japan. People misinterpret why people or the Japanese wear masks. They wear the masks as a, mostly as a sign of courage and respect because if I have a cold, I don't want to spread it to you. So I'm doing this for a positive reason. I'm wearing a mask because I don't, if I'm, because I'm sick, I don't want to infect my, my fellow citizens. That would be the Nebraska nice thing to do. So we're going to start acting like the Japanese and wearing masks more often. And instead of shaking hands or a hug, we just need to do a bow or something like that because we need to not touch. So I have a mask uh, that my niece's mom made and sent, sent us to us. So I wear a mask when I'm out and about. Uh, I'm at the point where if I go to a grocery store and one grocery store is, has, has a mask requirement, one doesn't, I'm going to go to the grocery store that has a mask requirement. At this stage of the game, everybody at, in, a, in a place like that or a mall or grocery store, I think should be wearing a mask. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't have our businesses open. And so I did ask this guy at GE Landscaping if I could take a picture because I thought they did an excellent job of their business. Uh, they, they have the plexiglass in place. They, uh, they, they have a sign saying only two people in. They have the, t the, the uh, place met, taped out so that you have, can easily maintain your six-foot distance. This is a way to have a business and, and do it right. So our, some of our businesses, I think, are doing a great job. Uh, and again, you know, your bad decision of not wearing a mask could be the difference between a spread like this and a spread like this. So start wearing masks when you're in crowded areas. I do not think you need to mask when you're uh, up when you're wearing when you're riding on the bike path, for example. If you're in a spread area and it's open uh, and you're outdoors and you can stay six feet away, I don't think you need a mask. But if you're indoors, like a grocery store or a mall, I would wear a mask. Uh, and the last thing, again, I'm, I, I've started getting comments uh, on the YouTube of, from the conspiracy theory folks that don't want to believe any of the data. Uh, I think the data has been wrong, and uh, so I'm going to say one more time. It's been three times now. No one's taken me up on the bet. Uh, uh, and, and if I win the bet, I will donate the money to charity. I'm not going to benefit by a debt, 
uh, bet on dead people, but I want people to quit, you know, talk as cheap. You can post all the comments you want. Uh, I'm going to say that that initial model from UNMC, that 50 to 180 deaths, that's right for both Grand Island and Lexington and will be right by this, by July 1st. And this model that people keep citing is way off. And even the 72,000 numbers that was cited recently, that's going to be gone. That's going to be wrong by July 1st easily and so if you think that model's right and if you think this model's right and all this is a conspiracy put your money with it where your mouth is if i win the bet i'll donate that ten thousand dollars to lincoln community foundation's coronavirus relief fund if if, if i'm wrong and you're right i'll donate that ten thousand dollars to the charity of your choice so hopefully this helps you all. Again, uh, like I say, disclaimer, this is not necessarily the opinion of all the people I work with or for. Uh, however, this is my roles in the community. So uh, this is what I do. And uh, as you can see, it, it, you know, coronavirus touches all of this.